Very good morning. What a pleasure. Uh, we are on the second day. We had a fantastic uh, inaugural day. Um, several luminaries gave uh, fabulous talks. Today we are starting the session with another fantastic researcher, speaker, teacher, and also a great friend. Uh, professor, let me say a few things about him. Professor Robert Lloyd Wetton, uh, we call him Rob. Uh, he calls himself as a molecular metallurgist. Uh, his research area reads like uh, molecular and discrete metallurgy. And of course, he does chemical physics, uh, protected clusters, and he is interested in uh, structure and bonding. So molecular metallurgy, right? That is what uh, he does. Uh, and you will hear more about him uh, today. He received his PhD from Cornell University in chemical physics. And he had a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Exxon Research and Engineering. And then uh, he uh, went to University of California, Los Angeles, where he uh, quickly rose uh, to the rank of full professor. Uh, and then he moved to other institutions. He went to Georgia Institute of Technology, then to University of Texas, San Antonio, and he's currently at uh, Northern Arizona University. We have met uh, many, many times, and each of those meetings have been so invigorating, exciting, uh, and full of uh, molecular metallurgy every minute and uh, every lunch and every dinner and, and every coffee break. Uh, forget about other breaks that we had. And it, it's a pleasure to invite you to deliver this lecture. I will give you a, a, a warning after 35 minutes or so, your lecture is for 40 minutes. That includes a short discussion. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you, uh, Professor Pradeep, and to your uh, your committee and uh, for the um, opportunity to participate in this meeting. And uh, I, I wish I could be there in the, the conference hall. And I, I say that sincerely, and uh, especially the opportunity to meet the uh, the young people. Uh, my understanding is that uh, that those are the ones we want to address um, with um, uh, emerging frontiers <clears throat> in the chemical sciences. I enjoyed the uh, the sessions uh, yesterday, insofar as I was able to remain awake because. Right now it is, uh, it's evening here, it's dark. And the, the moon hasn't uh, arisen yet, but uh, it's about 8.30 PM. And so uh, I was able to stay with you until about one or two. I enjoyed uh, hearing the, the, the awards and the, uh, the, the first speakers, the honored speakers, and uh, hearing my friend Tatsuya Tsukuda uh, give a, a brilliant presentation there, as well as uh, our host, organizer, Pradeep, and I'm looking forward to the other part of the meeting, um, Jian Ping Shia, uh, certainly someone whose work I've followed and met many times, and I always learn a lot from, from these, uh, these people. Uh, sometimes I learn more from uh, the, the silence sometimes than from uh, the, uh, the gentle uh, criticisms and advices, so uh, I expect it'll be the same this time. So let's me move to the screen sharing mode. I'm not adept with the uh, so adept with the technology, and I appreciate all the tech support that uh, can be offered here. And I'll go to the first uh, test slide here, and I uh, get myself a laser pointer. And so we're here in the. Uh, I'm going to minimize. No, I can no longer remove it from my screen. That's a shame. Okay, let me go back. Sorry. Let's see if I can. Yeah. All right. Now it's on the thumbnail. So, uh, laser pointer. Here we go. 
So emerging frontiers in chemical sciences uh, with uh, orientation toward uh, the young uh, people in the audience, the, the ones who are at the start, the early stages of their career or their advanced education and, and possibly moving toward research. Uh, for the title of my presentation uh, today, I picked uh, some recent work from our uh, some recent work from our our labs and collaborators, and so I'm calling this talk "Electrospray Gold Standards." And you could probably come up with a short "Electrospray Ionization of Gold" uh, for that that I can use repeatedly. And the mass range we're talking about is 32 to about 52 kilodaltons. Uh, would be the prime uh, mass range under discussion today. And so I am Robert Wedden, and I'm right now presently at 1899 South San Francisco Street, the, uh, the address of our university. 1899 is also the year that our university was founded. It was just a few years after the Lowell Observatory was established, just, uh, just a couple of miles away. And this is the observatory where the planet Pluto uh, was discovered back in uh, 1930, and the discovery was announced simultaneously in the auditorium uh, very near where I'm sitting right now, seated right now, and, um, and, and also simultaneously in, in uh, Boston at that time. So we're not in the, uh, the deserts, the desert valleys of, of Arizona, but rather up quite high in the mountains, around 7,000 feet or 2,200 meters and the mountains go on up uh, from there, as you can, uh, as you can uh, tell. So, um, so electrospray gold standards, again, gold standards is somewhat of a pun in, intentionally. And uh, we're from the uh, departments of applied physics and materials science, as well as chemistry and biochemistry. And we also have our center for materials interfaces in research and applications. So I'll just need to, uh, to give that credit. Electrospray in, in, in modern times, and, and especially to chemists and molecular biologists, means an arrangement something like this, where there's a, a fluid, typically a solution, and uh, the solution is charged by applying a potential to a needle, like a hypodermic needle, uh, with respect to uh, uh, ground somewhere else, or vice versa, ground with respect to to this, so there's a high voltage applied, and there's uh, roughly an atmosphere or two of pressure in in here uh, in the chamber, which provides a warm bath gas. It prevents the the jet, the expanding jet of liquid, from simply uh, freezing up. It removes the the uh, or it supplies the heat of, of vaporization, and the charged uh, spray breaks up into a very fine mist. All the details are, are can't be seen optically here so easily, but uh, and out of that emerges ions. And the electrospray ions can be used for all sorts of purposes. They can be deposited, they can migrate through gases uh, under the action of an electric field, and they can even ultimately end up in, in high vacuum inside a, uh, a modern mass spectrometer. And so that's the meaning of the term electrospray, just defining some terms here, uh, gold standards. Um, I won't have a chance to say too much about this in the time that we have available today. The virus-like clusters, which was in the subtitle. Instead, I'll refer you to the papers of T.P. Martin, Tom, Thomas Patrick Martin, and especially the 2001, this is the Nobel Symposium uh, 117, where he defines this, uh, this uh, analogy between uh, the surface structure of clusters of atoms and the uh, surface structure of viruses or viral uh, viral capsid, who will have a chance to visit some of these uh, some of these numbers as as we go. So that was the other part of my title was that the gold clusters are going to be related to that. As I was preparing the talk and looking back, I recalled that our first intimation of the main um, the main um, actor here in this presentation was detected in 1995, and it was Dr. Sri Hari Murthy, um, uh, a postdoc at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And uh, this, this first detection, there's, there's something kind of paradoxical in this that, that we can come back to, but this is roughly what the results looked like. Uh, this was a custom-built mass spectrometer that we had. It was about 80 kilovolts, which is a bit dangerous 
to build yourself in the lab, the, the potential difference to the detector. And that allowed us in the instance of, of, of Dr. Murthy's preparation, it allowed him and his student colleagues to, um, to generate mass spectra that looked like this. And they all look about the same. These are different samples, different ways of doing the laser desorption ionization method. And this was June of 95. I was actually traveling in, in Italy at that time, but Uzi Landman, who is our theoretical colleague, uh, came down and, and, uh, and advised Dr. Murthy quite a bit on his finding that, uh, that there were samples being produced uh, that gave almost exclusively 30 kilodaltons. And then one sees the multiples of 30, 60, 90, or a little bit less. And that's just the, uh, the clustering of in the, in the laser desorption uh, plume. And um, if one calculates from 30 kilodaltons and says, this is pure gold, uh, you would come up with about 150 gold atoms, each gold atom being about one fifth uh, of a kilodalton. Okay, uh, we'll see the uh, periodic table chart in, in just a minute here. Um, and we did believe that what's being seen here is essentially pure gold, uh, maybe some sulfur uh, in the high resolution uh, mass spectrometry done in Stuttgart that year. Um, but that all the organic part, all the remainder of the ligands was removed. And so if you space those ligands out around the, the, uh, a gold core, just taking the density of bulk gold with about 150 atoms, then it would hold a, a, around 60 ligands around the, uh, the core. So one could imagine a concentric shells where one has a pure gold core, and then on the outside, some sulfur atoms and linking to the organic part. And there could be about 60 of these. And of course, the, um, the discovery of the buckyballs carbon 60, the icosahedral carbon 60, carbon 80, fullerenes was fresh in everyone's mind. And so at least in the early presentations in 1995, <clears throat> we said maybe this is the, um, the equivalent of carbon 60 that somehow um, 60 is a, um, is a special number in metrology and, uh, and certainly in geometry, three-dimensional geometry, and it could be like that. And none of these things were terribly far, but the, 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 uh, the surprising thing was how difficult it was to improve on these things through the years. And there's no time to go into that right now, but I can give credit uh, along the way to some of those who tried. Now, this became a kind of standard for us in our lab and to other people that, that we got to know uh, the groups in, uh, you know, such as uh, Matthias Brust and, and David Schifrin in England and, uh, and, uh, and um, Royce Murray's lab in North Carolina, Chapel Hill being very near to Georgia, comparatively speaking. And so there were standards for all kinds of things, uh, suggestions from interested observers, mostly physicists, and practical people who uh, just wanted to use something like this if it became available and, and stable. So one is a, a standard for voltammetry, uh, the capacitance in a volt, voltammetric uh, measurement, such as this diff DPV, differential pulse voltammetry, shows this long series of what are believed to be single electron redox states. So this suggests reversible transitions among 12 or 13 charging states as though the core is behaving like a little metal capacitor, little metallic uh, sphere taking up electrons and, and removing them with, with no great gaps uh, anywhere in there, okay? And also structural work started right away, uh, all kinds of uh, diffraction work, powder diffraction, electron diffraction, and so on. And so there was an interest in, in these things. Now, these images that I show over here on the right, everyone thinks they're just idealized geometrical images. And, um, and they certainly look that way with these circles drawn around them. But these are actually from the experimental atomic coordinates that were ultimately determined. So these are the con concentric shells of, of gold atoms superimposed all the way through. And the final one shows uh, how the ligands um, are attached. So it really did turn out to be something like a globular sphere. And uh, if we have a little time at the end, this isn't a structural chemistry talk, but we can go through, through some of those, those things. All right. Um, one of the remarkable things about uh, 
modern chemistry uh, with its uh, cooperation between experiment and theory is that if you start out with a pretty good model, the theorists, computational theorists, such as density functional theory, will take it from there. And so there were many attempts over two decades to arrive at a consistent structure that could explain this. And, um, and this um, animation shows theory experiment, shows the, the phenyl groups on the outside, that's from the crystallography. And you can see that the, in this case, the theory was done first before the single crystal structure was determined, but they're essentially um, uh, perfect on, on the scale that, that we can view them right here. So everything in this structure uh, that you can see that's, that's the multicolored, those are all the different kinds of gold atoms in the structure, including the yellow ones. And then only the green, the lime green represent the sulfur, and then gray represents the, the carbon uh, framework, the benzyl pilate in, in the case of this, this structure. So in that sense too, um, these represent a kind of standard um, for symmetry, for structure on this particular scale. It's about two nanometers if we go from, uh, from a sulfur atom to a far opposite sulfur atom, almost exactly two nanometers diameter. And so you can work out the surface area and all the other uh, numerics from there. Um, now, molecules of gold, okay, was that somewhere? In the title, it certainly was in the abstract. That phrase, molecules of gold, comes from the 1856 paper of Michael Faraday. The paper has this title, Experimental Relations of Gold, et cetera, to light. And he had uh, some preparations uh, of colloidal gold, we would call it sometimes nowadays uh, in later years. He never used that term, but he asked about these special ones, whether these could be considered molecules of gold. Faraday being a very good chemistry and having arguably the best lab in the world at that time, isolated many compounds, starting with benzene, many others, okay, could be expected to act on, on such an idea and try to uh, purify the products. Um, but for various reasons, this uh, could not be attempted at that time. And it's for us to, to maybe kind of learn about that. Here's some other things that were going on <clears throat> around that time. This is the um, um, an image of Faraday in 1856, just to show it wasn't at the start of his career. He was uh, 65 years old in the middle of that, uh, that year. And uh, in contrast to the image we have as a, a younger uh, discoverer, explorer, and this is what the paper actually looks like. This is the copy I got uh, one rainy day in Munich on the, the Deutsches Museum there on the island in the river there and, and read, they let me handle the original copy and I made a photocopy and spilt things on it and marked it up and so on. But this is the way it actually looks in the proceedings of the Royal Society, the Bakerian lecture, experimental relations of gold and other metals to light by Michael Faraday. This sounds like some of the introductions I heard yesterday to some of the distinguished speakers, but here it is received on this date and read publicly on this date. Uh, the paper begins with these words, that wonderful production of the human mind, the undulatory, we would say wave uh, theory of light, electromagnetic radiation, with the phenomena for which it strives to account, seems to me who am only an experimentalist and uh, so on. And then everything about the, um, the dimensions of the gold structures that are quoted after that are expressed in terms of fractions of the wavelength of visible light. So that was the, the measuring tool, if you will. Uh, you might ask um, in this talk and other talks and, uh, and also uh, uh, your colleagues, why such an emphasis on gold? Uh, there's any number of reasons that people give. But uh, I didn't like that before. But this is in Faraday's own words in the paper. Being especially fitted for experiments of this nature, because of its comparative opacity amongst bodies, possession of a very real transparency, development of color in the reflected and transmitted ray. This is it Faraday typing? Can you see? It's, uh, it's 
not me typing. The division. I'm going to turn down the, the volume because it's so annoying. It didn't sound that way when I wasn't on the Zoom. Tenuity and division, which permitted permitted with the preservation of its integrity as a metallic body because of its supposed simplicity of character and because known phenomena appeared to indicate that a mere variation in the size of its particles gave rise to a variety of resultant colors. The wavelengths of light are so large compared to the dimensions of the particles that it seemed probable that they might come into effective relations to the much smaller vibrations of the ether particles, in which case, if all these different kinds of measurements, observations, depend on such relations, these functions would change sensibly by the substitution of different size particles of this metal for each other. Um, I wanted to show this and let you see it in full because it shows a couple of very important things. Number one, he was mostly interested in optics of metals, okay, and relations to the problem of the nature of light. Um, the second thing is, all of this is in the introduction. These are all quotations from what could be termed the art, the existing art of the field. So anyone who would say that, it, that he discovered these things um, has the story backwards. He re is relying on all these things already being known or understood at some level and taking it, it, uh, it further like this. So it's quite a misunderstanding to think that the paper is about um, colloidal gold. All right, so let's take a look at um, what we mean by a uh, gold standard. Here's something that Faraday didn't, couldn't have known. Uh, isotopes weren't discovered uh, definitely until about 100 years ago. In fact, the Nobel Prize for uh, the mass spectrometric determination of isotopes was 1922. So it's almost a perfect century since that was recognized with tables of the, all the stable isotopes of, of the many elements. Elemental gold has, a, <clears throat> besides all of its other properties, some of which were just mentioned, has a single stable nuclide or as we usually say in the lab, it's monoisotopic. It's gold 197. It's the 79th element in the periodic table and it's 197. So it's somehow easy to remember like that. And here it is 100%, the only stable one. The others periods of three, four, five days, half a year wouldn't uh, be around even if, if there was uh, some reason that they would be formed in the lab. So it's effectively 100%. And so this allows, um, a suggestion based on the idea of molecules of gold, Faraday molecules of gold, and that is that you could have a molecule where the mass is mainly made up of gold atoms, a very minimal amount of the mass is made of something else, such as in this example, CN group, cyanide group, 60 of those. Uh, by mass, that would give you only 1,500 out of 30,000. Uh, in other words, it's about 95 weight. And here's a simulation of a mass spectrum, a mass spectrograph. And um, for conventional reasons in the lab, we chose a charge state other than just one charge state for this. And this would be the case if one had just the formula that I just mentioned. And here's what it would look like if there was one extra uh, copper atom uh, in the center of this and copper being the two isotopes, mostly 63, a bit of 65. This is what it would look like. So on the mass to charge scale, which is common to all uh, mass uh, spectrometry measurements, um, 7840 right in here. So one fourth, in other words, of the 30,000 uh, total, the 2928. And the structure that you see here is the structure, if all the carbon is carbon 12, all the nitrogen is nitrogen 14 isotope, and the gold is pure 197, that would be the first peak. And then every one Dalton or one fourth of a mass to charge unit, sometimes called Thompson, one fourth of that. So on this scale, if you're reading that off, would be the one where one has predominantly one carbon 13, two carbon 13s, three carbon 13s. There's also a little bit of nitrogen 15, but this mainly looks like, if it looks familiar to you, maybe it's because you've seen mass spectra of carbon 60, which in their detail look exactly like this abundance pattern. Uh, the, the largest peak is, is the, the nominal 
um, mass, okay, uh, with everything having its most abundant isotope. And over here, uh, it's broader a little bit, but still peaks right here at the, the very first peak. And, uh, you know, anyone can get sharp peaks, right? But uh, the best thing, question is, can you get a good uh, baseline? That's the thing to watch out for is that first, because for a standard, you're going to need that to be able to identify uh, the first the first peak. Um, yeah, so um, to finish up with Faraday, here's the, the lecture um, on this. And this is a painting of it, not a, not a photo. And here's the, uh, the Prince of Wales, I guess it's Prince Albert. And this is one of the way they raised funds or they sec secured the support of their, their patrons, right? Through these uh, kind of public lectures and a lot of demonstration work of all the, the effects uh, being seen. We also have to uh, satisfy our, our patrons. And I want to mention the, 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 uh, the paper on which the, the bulk of this talk is based has this full title that I mentioned here, um, Dr. Hawk, uh, David Black, uh, in supporting role, Marcos Alvarez, uh, some other people from other institutions supplied a lot of advice and key uh, samples. Uh, we're also grateful to Wendell Griffith, some of you know him, and uh, to Tom, to T.G. Schaff, uh, starting out in 1996, really from Srihari Murthy's observation. Schaff studied with, uh, with John Fenn in Richmond, Virginia, and so put us, launched us on the path toward, uh, toward electrospray and microfluidics as, as the best way to analyze these things. Today, most of our lab's work is in support of bioconjugates, that's medical applications. I won't be talking um, any, anything about that toward this more, uh, more chemistry audience, but uh, we do have our, our publications and other work in that area. This is Dr. Hawk right here. Um, who's the first author on that paper, and uh, his wife right here. Uh, they're normally not dressed like this in the lab, but um, they are from, uh, from Bangladesh, and I believe this is a wedding uh, celebration photo. And I just mentioned John Fenn, who was the mentor, the first mentor to, uh, to Greg Schaff before he came to Atlanta and joined us there. And so you can see the dates, the chemist who enabled mass spectrometry to, among in, many other things, to weigh up, up uh, heavy biomolecules and assemblies, even when they're intact. Nowadays, it's even whole intact uh, viruses um, can be measured with some precision. So here's the key result of this paper. The key result of this paper is a confirmation or deduction of this formula for gold. Uh, again, the 197 isotope, 144 repeats of that. And these will all be for this part, these will all be thiolate ligands. So a sulfur and then an R group. The rest or remainder of the molecule will be the R group. And that's variable. There were eight different ones included here and, and, uh, and quite a few others done earlier, but not at this resolution or, or sensitivity. And the main peak, uh, the, the main species identified in the mass spectrum um, have different masses that can be deduced. And they span a range from about, well, it's advertised in the, the title of the talk, right? These are not integers, Dr. Hawk. So th this is around 32 and this is 52 for these two. I can't quite see that one up there, 52. Okay. And, um, and so those are the, the masses that I de are de identified for the, the different respective uh, samples. And these are plotted versus the mass of the R group. Is it the mass of the R group or the mass of the R group and the sulfur too? Yeah, it's the sulfur too. Sorry about that. But, uh, but that's what that'll mean. That R subscript will refer to the various R groups here. And there's some code C2, C5, benzyl, captamine, TEG OH, DTTM for the uh, you know, abbreviations for the organic, uh, the organic names. So this is the main result. Of, of, of this work is this correlation between the mass of the individual ligands in Dalton's, that's proton or neutron masses, and the mass of the total assembly. It has a slope of 60, 60.0. And so the 60.0 is interpreted as 60 repeats of the mass of the ligand. The intercept of the plot is 28,364. And that corresponds to the mass of gold 1, 144 to within the digits. 
uh, shown here. And so that's the way that a, um, a structure can be determined through uh, the mass spectra of a series of related compounds, provided they're all synthesized, prepared in different uh, places uh, in such a way that they'll give that as the main, the main component. Um, the, um, this top one here came from Hokkaido University in Japan, Sapporo, Japan, uh, Yohei Ishida and his uh, team there. Uh, this one came from the Polymer Institute in the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Most of the rest of these came from, uh, from Italy, from uh, Flavio Maran's group, Tiziano Dainese. And the captamine is the special doctoral work of uh, Dr. Hawk that you were introduced to momentarily ago. And um, so again, the numbers here are going to relate back to these kinds of, of, uh, of shell structures, especially the outer shell. But now I want to show you, um, yeah, okay, so this is the same thing, just to remind you what the simulation looked like. And now let's take a look at the isotopic patterns. Okay. So we have about uh, five minutes for the talk and then followed by five minutes. Of Very discussion. good, perfect. Uh, so let's take a look at the, uh, the actual isotopic patterns, not of a simulated compound of this type, but of the actual compounds. So they're gonna be shifted up in mass a little bit because it's not 26. In this case, C2, it's 61. And in this case, C4, it's closer to 90. And, but you can see here that uh, when the number of carbons isn't so high, like 120 carbons and 60 sulfurs, you have a very good fit. And also the experimental uh, does show a good baseline, a good baseline on both sides, right? Okay, and so the first peak can be identified. So that's crucial, but it's nothing like the fall off that one has here. For C4, it's almost too difficult, even with very clean sample, very good signal to noise, good baseline. It's very hard to be sure that that's the, the first peak, okay? Although with a well-calibrated instrument, it may just work out that way. This is what the global mass spectra looked like. I should have shown the first 4,000 to 12,000 the three plus charge state and four plus are the main ones detected in the positive ion mode. And then this very weak peak here, magnified seven times, magnified um, again, okay? And finally expanded all the way out is what gives that, that information. So you can see how clean it is otherwise. And the same thing with the, the C4 unit, thanks. And uh, this is just showing more of the, the detail in that. So that's uh, where we stand uh, so far on that, thus far on these as, as, uh, as mass standards, okay, the comparison. Um, moving on, let me just show you a little more detail about how this was done. There's the ethane thiol, propane, that's C3, butane, and C5 thiolate, so quite short to moderate length. The benzyl has a different structure. This is the one of the first crystal structure. Here's the captamine, it's a base. These first ones are neither acids nor bases when the sulfur is bonded to the uh, gold. The compound from Hokkaido University is a permanent uh, salt. Uh, it's a, a quat, quaternary ammonium uh, ligand, and it has a counter ion, uh, the phosphorus hexafluoride in, in the form that we received it. And then this is the one, the TEG, the pegylated uh, one like this. So that's the series. There's a couple others that aren't, aren't shown here. And this is the masses which are given in this. These are the solvents that they were handled in and uh, the different um, electrolytes or, or uh, um, agents that are used to help in the case it goes through a liquid uh, uh, capillary electro uh, liquid chromatography column or other things. This is what the mass spectra look like for the whole series. So um, C2, C3, C4, C5, the benzyl case, quite a different pattern there. And then the captamine being a base can take on protons or alkali ions, ammonium ions or something and it charges much more easily. And you can see the mass to charge ratio plotted here. So in this case, you've got charges ranging three to seven. In the case of the quaternary ammonium, and this was known previously, but, uh, but uh, but went a lot further, cleaner here, up to 11, 12. 
in the case of Ishida's group, they later, after we got this HPLC ESI MS result, they showed results going all the way up to 20 full charging. So pushing the master charge ratio down into the 3000, uh, 4000 range, which is desirable for many things. Here's the 10 plus maximum uh, for the, uh, the tagulated. Uh, recently, we've had a lot more success with smaller uh, clusters, Dr. Hawk, um, with, um, with um, PEG-12, not just the four plus one here, but, uh, but that. And so that should be uh, coming to. This is what it looks like overlapping, overlaying the different charge states for the samples from Hokkaido University. The pattern is more complicated than just a simple, simple peak. Um, and, uh, and all of that, uh, you know, is, is something to be analyzed by dealing with the internal uh, details of, of the structure. But we took the biggest peak. In this case, there's actually 62 counter anions in the base formula. And so that indicates that as, as sprayed, um, the gold cluster is positively charged uh, two times, okay, to counter that charge. All those, that information, the redundancy, the different charge states in that are all folded back up to unit charge. And so here you see this, the single dominant peak ranging from 32,000 up to 52,000 on this. And I already showed you the fit and described it. So this is just um, a friendly uh, review to finish up. At least I believe that I had my phone here. As a clock, and I don't know where I have put it, but I'm I'm counting on uh, on Professor Pradeep to to shoot this. So this is something challenging we did. This will be the final um, experimental result I'll show you. Is people say, well, if you have a very pure compound, then of course you may be able to get these very clean results. But what if you have a mixture? So this was a mixture of C2 to C4, I guess not C5. So ethane all the way up to butane thiolate and the benzyl case. And these are all roughly equal molar, equal molarity uh, contributions to the solution. And so the mass spectrum is indeed a lot more complicated in the three plus and four plus region. But you expand each of these out and compare them to the spectra of the pure compounds. And all of them are present there, not in equal signal intensity, but, but not, not nothing extreme. Uh, some of the extra features are, are using a, uh, a stronger acid, stronger protonating agent to help with the, the benzyl case. So all of that kind of detail is ex explained in our paper. So by way of summary, um, I mentioned the Faraday's legendary molecules of gold. Um, didn't have time to talk too much about the, uh, the structural uh, details of those, just uh, referred you to these. They give quite distinct striking charging patterns that depend on the, the way the core can charge, the electrochemistry inherently of the capacitive core, and also on the acid-base uh, chemistry or electrolyte chemistry of the, uh, the surface groups. Okay, um, we're talking about samples of about a picomole each to get those kind of mass spectra, so maybe 30 nanograms. So the sensitivity is very high and uh, when there's any problems, usually just running it through a capillary column directly into the mass spectrometer can help, uh, can help clean it up. We could confirm the, uh, the formula, okay, uh, is common to all of these very different masses. And this agrees with the, uh, the structure models that were known and also the, the total structure determination. I also wanna mention that the structure, the basic uh, elements of the structure have been known for a long time, over 20 years in the palladium 145 structure with the carbonyls um, doing the same kind of bridging, extra palladium and, and carbonyls doing the same kind of bridging that got called uh, term staples uh, later on are there, even including the intrinsically uh, chirality of the outer shell, uh, we believe. So I think with that, I will um, leave some time uh, for discussion. I just wanna be sure and thank once again, the, um, the, uh, uh, the organizers and for the opportunity to participate and learn from you all and to share a little bit of our, of our, recent, of our recent work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Witten. <clears throat> uh, it was 
fabulous uh, tour through ions and mass spectrometry and isotopes and structures and viruses and all of those. <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> consumed almost all, all the time, but we'll take go some five minutes extra you know, and then take some questions. Please unmute yourself and ask Tatsuya. You go ahead and ask. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very wonderful talk. I have one question. Uh, when you look at the, when you, we look at the mass spec of the Hokkaido sample. Yes. They are highly multiply charged. And uh, some charge comes from the ligand and some charge comes from the core. That's so correct. Do, so do you have any comment on the relative ratio of the core charge and the ligand charge for individual charge state, 10 plus, 9 plus, 8 plus? Right. So uh, that was the, um, the detail that I showed there. And uh, let, let me just go back real quick, lead to that example. I added this really in the last uh, nanoseconds. I hope you're able to, to view this. And so this is 10 plus you 11 share. plus. You need to share the screen. Okay, I thought I was. Ah, yeah, I failed to do the last step. Okay, so screen sharing and, uh, and notice this is a mass shift, all these different charge states. We multiply through the mass scale by these numbers, 10, 11, 12, and that brings them all up to a common zero of mass shift. But what is this zero of mass? When we look at that total mass, it turns out that this requires having 62 of the PF six minus, not 60. There's only 60 required to balance the, um, the charge on the R group, okay? So the other two, the other two, you can't see my cursor, I suppose, okay? The other two charges, negative charges, identify the core charge as two plus. That's for the main, the main peak identified. So if the charge is 12 plus, we would say only 10 of the cationic ligands are are, are free, are not compensated by, by this. The other two charges are on the, the core. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, takes me to, you know, ask this question that maybe a pH change or any such thing could uh, <clears throat> control a pKa or whatever could, could get you the kind of uh, stop all those, uh, you know, uh, protonation. Yes. That's right, and um, you're referring to changes in the the electros the electrochemistry of the electrospray process, or in to solution in solution in solution. Okay, yeah, yeah. right. All of these That's have right. a net pKa, and so there should be some some control that is possible by adjusting pH. That's right. There should be, and that should be the subject of a. Of a, of, a, of a nice investigation. I don't think we can assume that just because proteins of similar size and lobular shape have been understood, um, their charging mechanism that, and, and because the pKa values, et cetera, of these uh, can be very, can be very different, yes. So you started out, uh, you know, uh, looking at analogies or presenting the analogies between uh, the Martin's work, uh, the uh, virus uh, capsid and, and the st structures of these clusters. The question that I had was that as these uh, ligands are changing, yes, if at all there is a structure of, of whatever the ligand resulting in a virus capsid, uh, could there be changes uh, with ligands in this <laughs> so-called arrangement and how do you prove that apart from yeah. apart from uh, crystal structure so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so our main, of course, we don't have crystal structures for all of these different ligands here. And there are ligands which, which um, the results are very different. Um, the gold 144 with the 60 ligands does not form. Our interpretation, I believe it's the interpretation in the field, is whenever one has ligands that are more sterically demanding, then uh, it prevents crowding as many as 60 in a symmetrical arrangement around a core of this diameter. Um, and so um, this relates also to the question, you know, why should we be focusing on this one particular structure, this one particular size? By now, there are many, many, uh, many, many crystal structures uh, determined. And uh, uh, are they all uh, equally interesting? They're all, uh, they're all published in a very nice way. You have the coordinates in the da database and so on. But our feeling is that only a very few of these are really um, free in the sense that the ligand shape and size does not constrain, does not restrict the structure from obtaining its, its optimum form, which are the virus like cluster forms, the virus um, numbers of ligands on the on the surface. Yes. All right. Are there other questions? Uh, we are running seven minutes late. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, no issues. Uh, thank you I'll very much. Uh, well, sorry. What, what did you say, Rob? I said I've stopped sharing. Yeah. So that. Thank you, uh, Professor Wetton, for that wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll mute myself. We have a, a gift uh, to send to you, and that gift is uh, shown there, uh, and this will be in the mail in the next couple of days. Thank you very much.